So give the teachers patience, Lord, and wisdom. May there be a learning environment in the classrooms. May the parents get on board and help. We pray your protection over our students and teachers and staff as they care for our children during the day in a learning environment. Pray for Pastor Pete, Lord, as he's gone, that you would uh, revive and renew him. Recreation, Lord, recreate in him a passion, your spirit. Lord, fill him with your spirit. And Rebecca and their family, we praise you for them. Lord, we thank you for our pastor who loves you. Who loves his wife, who loves his family, who loves his church. Strengthen him today. Lord, continue to receive our praise. For we love you. We want to hear from you. We want your touch this morning. We need a word of encouragement from your spirit. Open our eyes and ears to what you have to say to us in Christ's name. I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements here this morning as we are looking to get some uh, small groups and classes uh, up and running here soon. You can uh, find all of this in your, your bulletin as well as I think we might have a few slides. Um, in here, it looks like there's a, a going to be a, a graphic here that might go along with it. But there's a ladies' Bible study, 10 a.m. Thursdays, that's going to be starting on the 8th. Uh, this is all coming up here soon in September, so exciting things. Uh, youth group's going to be starting up Thursday, 7.03 p.m., starting on the 8th. There's a new women's study, Thursday at 7 p.m. So this is a new, a new women's Bible study coming uh, Thursday at 7 and that one's going to start on the 15th, and a new discipleship group on Sundays uh, starting at 9.30 on uh, the 18th. So a lot of uh, great opportunities here. Uh, we encourage, uh, obviously, uh, uh, as much as you possibly can, uh, we encourage you to be involved and to find new ways to get together and to grow in and, and, uh, and, and your um, walk with the Lord together. Also, uh, ways to give to the ministry here at Medina Church of the Nazarene. Uh, there's a number of them. Uh, you can give online. Uh, you can give. There's a box in the back uh, where you maybe found your bulletin this morning. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, the key is the key is faithful faithfulness and uh, and continuing to do that and finding ways to do that, whether it's uh, using technology or not. Um, as we said before, we are glad to have. Um, Pastor Martin here with us today uh, to share with us. I know he's going to be bringing us uh, a word from the Lord here from uh, Acts, and so we're glad to welcome him. Although he's here uh, pretty much all the time as it is, it's not necessarily like welcoming you here as a, as a guest, but welcoming him here to uh, share with us this morning. So thank you, Pastor Martin. Hope Squadron. Is there Hope Squadron today? All right. Well, good morning, church. How y'all doing? Good. Today's sermon is how to position ourselves in order to better hear, to better hear uh, God's voice. Uh, when Pastor Pete, he usually gives me plenty of notice when he wants me to preach, so I try to put up my spiritual antenna when he asks me to preach, and I try to place myself in a position uh, where I'm listening for what God wants, wants to say to us. And so, yeah, I, I try to let God speak as he chooses. He speaks through prayer, obviously, and, and scripture and conversations with other Christians and sermons and books and songs. Uh, we got to take a vacation with our family, at least a couple of our kids and grandkids in Myr North Myrtle. And on the way home, we stopped in Charleston, West Virginia to visit some friends who used to live in Morgantown. And my conversation with Keith uh, led to talking about the importance of community in our lives, which involves corporate worship and prayer and ministry and decision making. And so we went to church the next morning and we heard a sermon on the importance of community. 
And then the topic also really resonated with my wife, and so we talked about that sermon on our way home. We're actually on our way to Fairmont to meet my brothers for lunch. And, and then last Sunday, Pastor Abby, Abby, excuse me, Abby preached, and one of the things that drew him to our church was his need to connect with the body of Christ. And his, and his last point in last Sunday's sermon from Psalm 146 was God dwells in the midst, in the middle of his people who worship and serve him. I've also been pondering a, a scripture that it, sh- it shows up in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew chapter 13, uh, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 4. It's when Jesus went to his hometown and uh, I mulled that over and thought about it. And Jesus said to his hometown folk, a prophet is not dishonored except in his native country and in his own household. And on account of their lack of faith, he did not do many miracles there. Some translation says he could do no miracles there because of the attitudes and the beliefs of Jesus' hometown folk. They were so familiar with him that their attitude and their group, whatever, when they come together, synergy, just was not conducive to Jesus doing miracles. And I, I don't want to become so familiar with Jesus that we, we uh, don't allow him to work. And so, so I kind of putting all those things together, if my impression from the Spirit is, is correct and right, uh, I, want to, I want us to consider today what Acts has to say to us. We all remember when cell phones first came out and Verizon capitalized on sketchy service. They they came out and said, can you hear me now? Remember that? Can you hear me now? That's because you had to put yourself in the right place, the right position to be able to use that cell phone service. Uh, Even yet today, there's a cabin on top of a mountain in West Virginia we go to, and I have to walk from the cabin down the mountain all the way to the lake so I can get cell service to put my, place myself in position to get cell service so I can receive calls. I was reminded on our way to North Merrill Beach that there are even places on the West Virginia Turnpike in those vertical mountains of West Virginia that I couldn't get cell phone service or satellite service. So again, I was not placed in the right position to get the signal I needed to get. So in the same way spiritually, I think we can position ourselves in order to better hear God's voice in our lives, especially in our decision-making. God, through his Holy Spirit, wants to lead us and and guide us every day of our lives. So let's look at Acts. This is just one passage that uh, continues what I want us to to consider today. Acts 13. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menea, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed there from Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to pay. pay Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bargesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. And then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. You know, the book of Acts is a great narrative of the early church. There are many miracles recorded, but if you go all the way back to the beginning, it all started on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the 120 who were gathered together in the upper room. 
And then they went out and started preaching after the Holy Spirit fell on them. Everyone understood in their own language, and we're told later on 3,000 were saved and added to the church that day. And by the time we get to Acts 13, one of the most ironic stories unfolds for us. We, if you follow the life of Paul, uh, Saul, he, Saul was a, a devout Jew. He was a, a teacher. He was the defender of the law. He was a lover of God and the Torah. He was on mission to persecute and destroy the followers of Jesus who claimed that Jesus was the Son of God. To him, it was heretical. He was the number one opponent of the early church, but by the time we get to chapter 13, he no longer is the number one opponent, but he's the number one convert and preacher and teacher and theologian of the gospel. So the big question among the early believers is, can we really trust this guy? We know his reputation. Now, try to put yourselves in their place. This guy has persecuted Christians. He's killed Christians. He was holding the cloaks of all those around when, when uh, Simon was being Simon Peter? Stephen, thank you. That's a senior moment. We're in this together, right? We need each other. That's what the sermon's about. We need each other. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't pull his name out of my head. I, thank you. <laughs> and uh, in Acts 9.21, it says, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on Jesus' name? It was Saul who was holding the cloaks of yeah, Stephen while they stoned him to death. But Saul met the resurrected. <laughs> That'll change you, won't it? He met the resurrected, ascended Christ on the road to Damascus. And he was asked the question, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So yeah, here he is persecuting the church, but because he's persecuting the church, he is actually persecuting Jesus. And Saul's life was instantly changed, and we meet we meet him now as Paul in chapter 13, and he's becoming the church's number one missionary and theologian, and he wrote many of the New Testament letters that we have. Paul's a great example of how God can bring change into anyone's life. So Paul has joined his fellow believers, the followers of Jesus in Antioch, and they're worshiping and praying, they're eating together, they're encouraging one another, and they are doing that because they're living in a very hostile environment. They're experiencing genuine persecution. Now, I, I think a lot of times when we use the term persecution, we don't really know real persecution. Uh, as, as the pastor said, I heard preach, he said, you know, in our, in our world, it's in, in North America, in the United States, it's really persecution light. There was an article in this Christianity Today a few months ago by a, a guy that uh, works, works for the State Department. He, he's worked under the Obama and the Trump administration. And one of his jobs is to track and observe persecution in the world, to actually visit countries, to track what's going on. And so he's witnessed persecution in a lot of countries. And he wrote an article, and the whole gist of his article is that, uh, folks, let's not rob the term persecution of its intensity and its veracity here in the United States. And he, he lists, we were going through COVID then, so he lists three reasons why, why what has happened in America during COVID does not reach the level of persecution. First, he talked about motive. He said, admittedly, I've seen many inconsistencies in governmental decisions, and he's met government officials who were anti-God and anti-religion, but for the majority, for the most part, our government is not out to rob, take away our freedom of public worship. Second thing he talked about was duration. He says, another reason why why COVID restrictions didn't raise us to the level of persecution was he reminds us that churches and synagogues and, and mosques and banks and hospitals and government agencies, all those places were temporarily closed for health reasons. The church wasn't singled out. In fact, the church was favored a lot of times and just suggested that they, they, they follow these rules. So that's not really, I think, I agree, that, that doesn't rise to the level of persecution. And the third thing he talked about was violence. Violence is always a part of persecution. Uh, persecution is brutal and violent. So when your church is stormed by commando-like police officers and raids and your church is bulldozed to the ground or your pastor and congregants are murdered for their faith, then that's called persecution. We've had Nazarene pastors murdered around the world in front of their congregations because of their faith. Christians in China, they're, they're trying to do away with every public symbol of Christianity. They're, they're removing crosses. If they got to bulldoze the church down to remove the cross, that's what they do. So uh, those, three, those three things he talked about. So the Christians in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago 
They were experiencing persecution. And as a result of that persecution, they were being scattered. And so one place they landed, obviously, was Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas were living there and fellowshipping with the other Christians. And from this passage, I think we can discover six ways to position ourselves to better hear the Spirit speaking to us and to confirm that it's the voice of the Spirit speaking to us. So number one, the Spirit's leadership and guidance is something that we must seek after and pursue. Verse 2, the Spirit told them to set apart Barnabas and Saul while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. And they were praying also, but you know, fasting is one of those spiritual exercises, those spiritual disciplines that we, we don't talk a lot about in the church because it's difficult and it's hard. Fasting is intentional. It's the spiritual practice of stepping back from food or activity or other distraction or that we might focus on prayer and seek the Lord. One of my favorite places to go is on the east side of West Virginia, up in a wilderness area, out on an outcropping up on one of the mountains in a grove of trees. There's nothing like it. No light interference, no sound interference, nobody's around. The Milky Way lights up at night like it's fluorescent. What a great place to meditate and think about the things of God with all distractions gone. Uh, it's hard to do that, but we got to work at it, don't we? Uh, it's no coincidence that while they were praying, while they were fasting, they sensed the Lord's direction. So they were intentionally and intensely seeking God's direction. And so it's no, no surprise that the Holy Spirit was faithful to their prayers. So the question for us this morning is, what are we in pursuit of? What are we seeking after? What do we really want? You know, we'll make incredible sacrifices in our life, when, especially when it comes to our kids, our children, our grandchildren, uh, to get something we really want. We push ourselves, we risk, we invest, we reprioritize, we become uh, single-minded. It's important enough to us or valued greatly enough, and I think that's true in all of our lives. Whatever is important to us, we, we prioritize that. Uh, now, I, I'm speaking about marathons because I've heard Pastor Pete talk about it. I'm not a marathon runner, nor do I ever plan to be a marathon runner. Uh, but I've observed, and I've heard Pastor Pete talk about, if you're going to be a marathon runner, it takes discipline, it takes training, it takes investment in time and energy. You forget how you feel, and you push through. My daughter-in-law's a runner, too. She's been to the Boston Marathon twice, and I know the sacrifice she makes. you got to push when there's more miles to go. You discipline yourself in your diet and in getting proper amount of rest. And uh, again, I'm speaking from their experience, not mine. So uh, I got other things I can talk about. But how intensely are, are we pursuing God, <clears throat> God's will in our lives? It, it doesn't just happen naturally. Not every decision we make off the top of our heads is in accordance with God's will for our lives. Now, folks, we don't have to live in fear. You don't have to, you don't have to, we don't have to go around wringing our hands all the time. But because we're assured that in our pursuit of God, uh, that he's with us. You know, he, he's, he's with us. He abides with us. He's going to lead us and guide us. He's, he's not trying to make his will hard to guess. He wants us to know his will. So do, do you regularly quiet yourself before God and listen to what he has to say? Now, all of us are in different positions in life, Right? The poor mom with four kids under preschool age, I hope she has a supportive husband that says, hey, you need to get away for a little bit. Let me take care of the kids. You know, I don't know where you are in life, but however we can do that, it's important to get in a place where we can hear God's voice, to remove the distractions from life. It doesn't have to even be a half hour or an hour. God has spoken more to me sometimes in five minutes than an hour sometimes. Are we in a position, do we place ourselves in a position to listen? Secondly, the Holy Spirit's guide is not just an individual thing. Now, don't turn me off here, okay? Acts 13, 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Again, back, back to Peter talks about us being living stones, being built together into a holy temple. Back to Jesus being in his hometown. The attitude of this crowd made a difference in what Jesus could do. While they were worshiping and fasting. And that cuts across everything we believe and practice culturally as Americans. You know, our individualism is just part of our DNA. It's part of our genetics as American citizens. 
and we believe that all power and privilege and right and might belong to the individual. In fact, it's become so emphasized that it's almost deified. I will do what makes me feel good. I will do what I want, when I want, how I want, what makes me happy, no matter how it affects everyone else around me. We've even created a vocabulary around this idea because we're called the me generation. And we need to notice that Paul didn't come to the Antioch worship service saying, God told me something. That's not what happens here. We've all been around people who said, God told me to tell you something. I've had people do that to me. Okay, if God told you to tell me something, well, I'm sure he's going to confirm it with me, right? Sooner or later. And this is a place where the Bible cuts across the grain of our culture and our ways of thinking that are many times bullheaded and independent. Now, I speak from experience here. I have been very bullheaded and independent at times in my life. I'm a firstborn of four boys and uh, kind of had to make my way, had jobs from the time I was 12 on. And uh, so I'm, I'm speaking from the experience here. You know, this message was for me before it comes to you. And uh, Luciano de Crescenzo, he's an Italian author, uh, kind of a philosopher. He's written a lot about Plato and, and other philosophies. But he said this while contemplating, and he's from Rome, from, from Italy. He said this while uh, thinking about the, the disciple or disciplined life. We are, each of us, angels with only one wing, and we can only fly embracing one another. I like that quote. John Wesley said much the same thing with different words when he talked about the protection and confidence that there is built in accountability and fellowship, discerning together the things of God. And so he formed his bands where people together sought the will of God for each other in prayer. And they dialogued and they read scripture. It was a group effort. It wasn't a solitary endeavor. He said something. It's a blessed thing to have fellow travelers to the New Jerusalem. Hey, by the way, do you like my bobblehead of John Wesley? I have it. He's sitting on my bookshelf at home, so I just stuck a sheet of paper. I took a picture. I don't know if that's what it looks like or not, but it's a great bobblehead. That's John Wesley. And he said, it's a blessed thing to have fellow travelers to the New Jerusalem. If you do not find any, you must make them, for none can travel this road alone. In so many places in the church, not, not just the world, but in the church, there's this resistance to community. And I want to say to us, community is right here. You can find it right here in the Medina Church of the Nazarene. And if you actually become a part of the community and avail yourself of all that the community offers, you'll receive what you need. The Spirit wants to speak to the community. He wants to give you confidence to operate in the community's blessing. And so many of us as American Christians overvalue our independence, but as followers of Jesus, we need to listen to and discern and learn from the discernment that's found in the community of faith. You know, it's in community, it's in the body of Christ that we can receive clarity and unity, and the Spirit's leading is confirmed. Well, this illustration is from my own life. It's not somebody else's life. But uh, after receiving my bachelor's degree and serving as a minister of music and youth for four years, I sensed more of a calling to pastoral ministry. So I I knew I had to go back to school to get what I needed to be ordained. So I made up a mind about the school I was going to go back to. But then people within the body of Christ, which included my wife, she was the first one to come to me. And I said, "Ah, nah, God told me, you know. But she was the first one to come to me and begin to prod me and ask me about the wisdom in that decision. And then the Lord brought two other people into my life, all at the same time, from different places. And they all said the same thing. So you know what I had to do because the Spirit was trying to tell me something. He confirmed, so I changed where I was going to go to school and get what I needed. And that, was, uh, that happened because direction was clarified and confirmed in my life for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Number three, the Holy Spirit's guidance is accompanied by blessing from the group. In this case, a confirmation came from the followers at Antioch, chapter 13, verse 3. After they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now, in first century 
terminology, confirmation was the language of blessing. They were encouraging and supporting Paul and Barnabas as they followed the Spirit's leading in their life. It's not just enough to ask for input, to request counsel from the community, but is their commitment on our part to follow their advice and counsel of the community. Paul and Barnabas, they didn't rush the process. They weren't out there waving goodbye to the church while the church was praying. <laughs> uh, what did they do? They waited to be sent. Their minds weren't already made up about what they were going to do. They actually waited on the church input before they made their decision. You know, if we're going to stay we're let, being led by the Spirit, then here is what we need to consider. If our fellow believers in our home, in our church, in our circle of accountability, if they don't sense God's Spirit leading in, in a particular direction in our life, or that the Spirit is guiding us to change or to take that next step or do that thing, whatever that thing is, if our circle of Jesus followers is not willing to place their blessing on it, then I think we should be very careful about proceeding. How many of us truly live that way? There's some Christian traditions that have done a fantastic job through the years of living that way. They decided early on that against the idea that Christianity is just an individual thing, they encourage and receive and ask for the input of their community of believers, their small group, their circle of friends who are Christians. The Quakers have pra practiced that for years. And they, they call on their people to use what they call clearness committees. And these committees are comprised of wise and trusted members of the spiritual community to pray, to ask them honest, open-ended questions to help them become clear about the next step in their life. And only once that clarity and agreement is achieved is the resulting decision blessed by the group. Now, I'm not talking about cultish practices here. You still have an individual choice and decision. I'm talking about in the Lord, in the Spirit, with people we trust. The Lord shows us in His Word that this is where strength comes from. And this is one of the ways that we experience God's blessing and the blessing of the church. We don't experience and enjoy the blessing of community just doing our own thing with an attitude that it's none of your business because I know what's best for me and nobody's going to tell me what to do. And it's a fallacy and it's immaturity that it's selfishness and it's, it's really messed up a bunch of lies because we've made a bunch of decisions that way. I speak from, I speak from experience on this matter also. Uh, I made a decision like that. Oh, it's God's will. Don't bother me, Sharon. Come on, it's God's will. We, we, we do this. I ignored what my wife said. I ignored what other questioning Christians said in my life. And I've lived to regret it many times over. But God has given us a better model to follow in the church. But will we yield ourselves to that and not be so prideful about it? That becomes the question. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit's guidance pushes us toward mission Involvement. Acts 13, 4 and 5. Paul and Barnabas were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit and they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. And I really appreciate the uh, credentialing process in the Church of the Nazarene. I mean, it fits right into what I'm saying this morning. Somebody kind of says, I feel called of God to be a pastor. Okay. If you feel called of God to be a pastor, then the church you're part of is going to testify to that. And so you get your local license recommended by the pastor. That local church board acknowledges, yeah, you got some gifts and graces. We see God working in your life. We believe he may be calling you. And then after you get experienced and more education, you go before the district through committees, education committees, and they, they quiz you for your character and credentialing committees. You go that process a few years. And then they also acknowledge that, yeah, God's working in your life. We're going we're gonna to credential you. And it goes all the way through ordination. And I appreciate that process because then, you know, you, you personally receive the call of God, but then you are confirmed and sent by the church into the field to be a pastor, to be a leader. The reason that they were sent out by the Spirit was to further the mission of God. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit didn't come so they could stay huddled together in their holy huddles. They were pushed out of the room into the streets of Jerusalem to preach the gospel 
And that's what we want to be as a church and as a people, furthering the mission in our community through our different ministries. And many of you are involved in ministries in our community and in the church, and you're doing that. You know, we can only do corporately together what we're willing to involve ourselves in individually. My ultimate purpose, your ultimate purpose as a follower of Jesus is that his kingdom might be advanced. Whatever decision you're now contemplating, the decision you're making, the direction you're now seeking, how will saying yes or no to that particular decision in your life advance God's kingdom? As followers of Jesus, serious about the kingdom of God, that should be our question. Can you genuinely pray the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, through me. Can you do that through me? And it's not just a rote prayer, prayer but it's a prayer you pray from your heart of hearts. If I'm considering buying a house, will that help advance God's kingdom or will it work to its detriment? If I change jobs, how will that help advance the kingdom of God or work to the detriment of the advancement of the kingdom of God? If I'm entering this relationship with a person whom I love, Maybe it's going to be a marriage relationship. How is that going to advance the kingdom of God or work toward its detriment? For the followers of Jesus, for the one who is in love with Jesus and his purposes, that becomes the ultimate gauge of how and why we make the decisions of life. I remember my brother next to me, Mark, at one point in his life, he, he, uh, they'd bought a bigger home, and I remember him selling that home discovering that the reason they sold it, it put them in a financial bind. And they couldn't, it, not only was it hard to live, but they couldn't contribute to God's work like they once contributed. They couldn't give to charity like they once gave. And, you know, we, we, we live on what we get, but I think we grow on what we give. So he sold it. They moved back into the little, little house they owned, and, and I think God blessed them for it. Number five, the leadership of the Spirit does not shield us from all difficulty and obstacles. Verse eight, a sorcerer opposed them and tried to turn another man from the faith. Paul and Barnabas were invited to preach to a Roman leader on the island of Cyprus, and the leader was called the proconsul, and he was the ruler. But there was opposition to their preaching. Surprise, surprise, right? There was someone who didn't want the gospel of the kingdom advanced, and that really shouldn't surprise us. We're going to have that at every turn. Paul in, Paul in Ephesians says that we're going to come against principalities and powers of this world who are in opposition to the things of Christ and to us. We live in a world where obstacles and difficulties and problems are going to rise on every hand. And just because we're being led by the Holy Spirit does not mean that we are immune to that. We don't live in a bubble. We don't preach a problem-free gospel. We don't follow a leader, Jesus, who was protected from suffering and difficulty. Jesus faced those struggles, and why should we be surprised when we do as well? Jesus said, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. Don't believe that just because you're facing opposition and difficulty that you're not being led by the Spirit. (laughs) Don't believe that you've missed God's call in your life or his will for your life. We have God's abiding presence with us, and he will make us overcomers in Christ. The last point, the Holy Spirit's leading is purposed for life change. Verse 12, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Paul and Barnabas met this sorcerer. He was opposing them, and God miraculously struck the sorcerer with blindness And witnessing that, and as a result of the problem, as a result of the difficulty, God was able to interject himself into the situation. And the pro-council believed and trusted the Lord as a result. Isn't it interesting how God works? He led Paul and Barnabas from Antioch across this portion of the Mediterranean Sea to the island of Cyprus, and somehow, some way, they were led to a Roman ruler who invited them to preach. And even though there was opposition, somehow, someway, God used that opposition to reveal his power. And as a result, that ruler, Sergius Paulus, was redeemed. This is what matters when it comes to our decisions in life. Our end goal as followers of Jesus 
should be redemption, salvation, life change. From glory to glory, he's changing us. He's sanctifying us to become more and more like Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit is always after. So what's your end goal? What's your end game? If you're making your decisions in your life based on your own blessings and accomplishments in life and how it's going to benefit you, then that's diametrically opposed to how the Word of God is saying we need to be making our decisions in life. The Holy Spirit wants us to ask the question, what difference will this decision make in somebody's life? Eternally. It could be your life or someone else's. But that's the most important thing to keep, us as, to keep before us as followers of Christ. May it be so in our lives. But 2,000 years ago, the Lord prepared a meal so that his followers may join together around his table. I want us to confess our faith together as we say the Apostles' Creed. It will be on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's say the prayer together the Lord taught his disciples. It's a good prayer of confession too. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This table, this is the table, not, not of the church, but of the Lord. It's made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come. Come. You who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not. You who have followed and you who have failed, come. Because it's the Lord himself who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. Everyone is invited to come and partake of Christ, his body and his blood through the bread and the cup. And as we sing and take from the table the body of Christ broken for you, take the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you, taste and see that the Lord is good. It is at his table we're reminded that we are a family, the body of Christ, a community of faith, showing our world what it looks like to live together in community as citizens of the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would sanctify this bread and cup, set them apart for your use today. May they become for us the body and blood of Christ. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As we sing Jesus Messiah, just come and go through the line and receive your, your bread and, and your cup as you're ready to do that. sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness 
He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel. The rescue for sinners. The ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body, the bread. His body, the bread. And his blood, the wine. Broken and pout, all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah name above all names the blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, He's the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. this blessing from Jude to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, <laughs> now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace and joy and love.